You're in a dark room, nobody around. The golden sphere of souls appeared and covered my feet. And my feet were warm. That's when I realized my body was dead cold. And it started moving up my legs and in my fingers. And when it got to my heart, this one was like, whoa, I was in the middle of the universe. Oh my God, it's beautiful. I can see planets, galaxies, the entire universe. I can feel the whole thing. We fly through the space. It's wonderful. You can do that forever. We can do this forever. I am very excited to be here with Greg as he's had multiple near-death experiences as well as a shared death experience. And we're just going to jump in today. So Greg is a retired IBM software engineer who lives with spirit guides daily. Thank you, Melissa. Pleasure to be here. Likewise. I'm going to talk about two NDEs. The first one is 1986. I was, as mentioned, a software engineer. I had just gotten promoted to be a, a, a technical advisor or director for uh, the MBS operating systems at uh, US West, which was a home company. MBS operating systems uh, run mainframe computers. So it's had people in uh, four different data centers that have managed. I was a technical director, so I didn't have to deal with the management side. I just dealt with the technical side. It was fun. I'd had the job for about two weeks. And after that, one of my colleagues got promoted to my old job and he wanted to celebrate it. It was on, on a Thursday that that was announced. And he said, let's all go out for a drink after work. And uh, he, he was buying. And so I thought, well, I've got some things I'm supposed to be doing. That Saturday, I was supposed to fly out to Philadelphia to be with a bunch of other IBM accounts. And we were writing a white paper to give to IBM, and I wasn't ready for it yet. So I was planning to take Friday off and work on a Thursday night, Friday and Saturday before I flew out. So this is going to put a crimp in that. So I said, I, I'm not going to be able to do that. I thanked him for, I didn't thank him. I, left, I, I praised him for taking the job. And it was a, quite a promotion, quite frankly. And he was excited about it and he said, well, I really want you to come to the party tonight. Uh, after work. And I said, well, you know what? I, I really have a couple of things I have to do. He said, well, I'll save a table for you. I said, okay, fine. So I headed on home and I decided I'm just not going to go to that party. And I'd been home for about an hour working on the paperwork I had to do. And I got a call from another colleague who said, well, we're all at the party. Where are you? And knowing, of course, back in those days, you know, if you answer the phone, well, you know where you are. So I said, well, I, you know, I just can't go. I got too much to do. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. You're his boss now. I said, well, only on the technical side. He said, yeah, but you're his boss. If you don't show up, that's not good news. You need to come here and appraise him and, and say it to a bunch of people. There's like 30 people here. You need to be here to let a larger audience know that you uh, really like the fact that he got the job. And so he's making me feel guilty. So I kind of go, okay, fine, fine, fine. So I decide I'm going to go. I get in the car and I start to drive there. And my steering guides, which they tell me things off and on, they put pressure on my shoulders, push me down. To that, what that means is I'm in mortal danger. And I thought, well, all I'm doing is going to the, to the bar, have one drink, and, and leave. That's okay. So I got there. Sure enough, there was like 25, 30 people there. And this bar, another reason I didn't want to go is this bar is known for pushing drinks. I mean, really big time. By the time I got there, the party had been going for about two hours. There was a seat sitting there for me at the table. And there were five, count them, five drinks sitting there waiting for me. Now I kind of go like, I, this is bad news. This is bad news. And, uh, and the, the pressure is on the shoulders again. You're going, yeah, yeah, I get it. So I waited for a few minutes and there was a lull. So I stood up and I gave a, a speech about uh, Leon, the guy that had just gotten promoted. And he was happy about it and such. And I sat down and I thought, well, I'll just finish this one drink. <laughs> I'll just finish this one drink. And now to sneak out. Well, I did. And I got up, started to leave. And Leon saw me and he said, 
where are you going? I said, well, I've got to go back home. I got some work to do. He said, no, no, no. And they listed off a couple of people who hadn't shown up yet. They have to be here. They have to be here before you can go. And I should have just said no, but I didn't. I sat down. And the next thing I know, it's one o'clock in the morning and the bars are closing. And believe it or not, there was five drinks sitting in front of me. The way they did it was that if anybody of the 25, 30 people that were there needed a new drink, everybody else got another drink too. Rounds for the house, rounds for the house. Every, and that's, you know, somehow I managed to keep up evidently. But as soon as, as soon as I stood up, I realized I was in trouble. I was drunk. And I had to drive home. And I'm going, no, this is not a good idea. So I thought, well, I'll, they hadn't quite, quite closed the bar yet. I said, I'll have somebody there call me a cab. And I'll, I'll take, get home that way. And then it dawned on me, no, well, wait a minute. I have the carpool tomorrow morning. And it's too late to start telling, calling people to say, can I get somebody else to ride, drive? So I thought, okay, I'm going to have to drive home. So I get in the car and get onto the freeway, 405 uh, northbound. I have to go about a mile. And then I uh, take the exit that uh, takes me on the 520 eastbound. I'd be home in 10 minutes. No big deal. So I take the 405. I take the exit off of to get onto 520. It is a road that goes kind of down and swerps around a little bit. And because actually 520 goes underneath 405. So I'm taking the corner, going around it. And the next thing I know, the car is out of control. And it's rolling and moving around. And, it fight, and then I'm knocked out. When I come to, I kind of go... What happened? Where am I? The car is not moving. It's upright, but it's not moving. The engine's running. The lights are on. And, and I look around at the window, front windshield, and I look and something's wrong with the windshield. And after blur, blurred, you know, blurred vision, first of all, I look at it kind of going, there's something really wrong. And I turned off the engine, left the lights on because I noticed I was on 520. So I'm, I'm on the road here, but I'm not moving. What's going on? I pushed the door open because I, it wouldn't open normal. So I really pushed it hard. I got the driver's side open, got out of the car and took a look at it. And I knew why it took so long to get the door open. The top of the roof of it was smashed down. And every single window in the car was missing. They were all broken off. The sides of the vehicle looked like it had been through hell. There were the, Tires were flat. This car wasn't going anywhere. I'm going, oh, great. Now what do I do? Well, I had help. The state police drove by, going the other direction. They, there was a meridian between the two uh, lanes, eastbound and westbound. And so he turned on his searchlight and looked at me and said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm okay. And he said, is there anybody else there? And I said, no, I'm, no, I'm by myself. He said, good, good. And he, he said, I'll be right there. And he drove down, did a U-turn, came back. We won't bother with all that detail. <laughs> yeah, there was a there was interest in why I had that accident. But I had to go to the hospital because I was bleeding. My face was bleeding. And got there. The doctor took care of that. It turned out it was just a cut over the eyebrow and bleeding like crazy. And, of course, blood, any kind of injury on the head causes a lot of blood. And I also had a bump on the top of the head that was, oh, gosh, I know, about a quarter inch high. And the doctor said he was surprised. He said, you're, 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 you're having a lucky night. I'm going, I am? <laughs> he said, yeah, well, first of all, you won't have any scars from the, from the face because the eye, it's on the eyebrow. And secondly, the bump on your head, for some reason, didn't cause any major damage. He said, you're very lucky there. And I said, okay, fine. So anyway, after a bunch of filling out paperwork and all well, that kind of stuff, I ended up at home. And needless to say, Friday, I decided to take the day off. <laughs> I had no car, and I was still hungover. And so then I canceled the trip that I was going to take to Philadelphia the next day for a meeting with some bunch of IBMers. And Friday night, I started feeling a little bit better, but I, I needed, I basically slept pretty much Friday. When I went to bed Friday night, I started thinking about what happened, what really happened. And 
I started going back through the dream of what was almost like a dream state. And I realized that after the car had stopped moving, yeah, I was knocked out. I wasn't there. I remember going up in a dark gray void, moving upward, and there were two spirits floating around me. They were kind of like smoke, gray smoke, if you will, just in about a couple of feet long, and two of them, and kind of one side at a time. And one of them, when it got around me, would put up a, make a face and look at me and say, why are you here? And then keep on going around. The other one didn't say anything. I kept moving up and I'm feeling pretty bad. I mean, I just didn't done something really stupid. And as I was going up, it started getting lighter and lighter. The dark gray became a light gray and slowly it was getting whiter and whiter. And I became aware above me of some intelligence and it was kind and loving and the, the love that was being given to me went right through my soul and made me warm it felt so so good except for the fact that i felt guilty because i had just done something stupid driving and then while drunk and slowly but surely kept moving up and moving up and i was being welcomed by whatever it was above me. I don't like to call it God or spirit or anything. I've never been able to figure out a name for it, but you get the idea of what I'm talking about. And it was welcoming me, loving me, caring for me. And as I got closer, and I'm getting pretty much just white around me, and I'm still feeling guilty as heck. I wasn't looking up. I, I, I was so ashamed, I couldn't look up. And all of a sudden, there was this consternation of some sort. And then the word, no, and I was thrown back into my body. It wasn't time to go. I wasn't supposed to be there. Then I had, going through my mind, well, what did I do just before that? Why did the car not make it around that exit corner? And so I started thinking back on what happened step by step as I took that corner. And I remember taking the exit lane, turning and starting to go down the curve to get to the 520. And then it dawned on me. I took my hands off the wheel. I tried to commit suicide. I had no prior thought about doing that. None. I have never thought about it, never wanted to do that. But enough alcohol, I guess, and the pressure of trying to get this paperwork done and having just gotten a new job, trying to figure it out. It was all just too much, evidently. Not so, not excuses, it's just facts. So I had to live with that for quite a while. Life got better though. And it was kind of a quick thing, but it took a long time for me to start getting feeling better. And thank God I had to, I did have spirit guides that helped. And that's that's a yet again another story. The other NDE is much, much more powerful. It in fact changed me. That was in 2013, quite a few years later. And during that period of time, I had been promoted several times. And that I was now making a pretty damn good salary. <laughs> and I was working 60 to 70 hour weeks. Not because I had to, but because I enjoyed it. I was writing code. And I love writing code. It's creative, being creative. And I was writing code to test code. So I was testing code. And I was writing the code to make it, try to break it before it goes to the customer. And so that was, that was keeping me very busy. And somewhere in 2012, middle of 2012, I started feeling not too good. And I went to a bowling party, bowling party, and I rented some shoes and the shoes I got were larger than what's normal because my foot was bigger than it used to be which seemed weird to me. My feet had swollen up a little bit. My legs had swollen up a little bit. We went to San Francisco in September, Nancy and I did. Nancy's my significant other. She and one of her coworkers were going to a convention. And so I went along with them, the idea of, hey, get, the, get to go to San Francisco. And so 
while there, I found that I was having trouble walking a block down the street. Now, there actually are hills, in, of course, in San Francisco, but there are also flat areas. <laughs> and so walking on a flat area, especially on one street, I don't remember the street number, there's a lot of art galleries. And so we're wandering into those to just look around. I could walk about a half a block and I was out of air, out of breath. I just couldn't do it. And so I was Nancy's coworker, also was having trouble. She had a, a hip problem. So she could walk for more than about a half block. So we were laughing because we'd only walk about a half block. And Nancy, of course, would be up three or four blocks down the street. She could. So coworker Elizabeth suggested that I go see her doctor because there's obviously something wrong. And so I agreed to do that. And when I got back home, made an appointment for the doctor, and it took like two months to get in to see him because I was a new patient. When I finally got in to see him, he took an X-ray of my lungs just to see, figure, well, that's a good place to start. And he goes, and he brought it out and showed it to me. He said, see, look at that. I'm going, okay, I don't know what I'm looking at. He goes, oh, yeah, okay. So he said, one moment. He came back with another x-ray of another patient he said ignore the name on the uh, the norm uh, on the corner of the x-ray he said legally i'm not supposed to show this to you but since it it's actually a healthy lung i don't think the woman would mind and so she showed it next to me side by side with two hers lung were white mine were black and i said i get the impression that that's not a good idea that's black and he goes oh no that's not good at all and I said, well, what's going on? He said, that's liquid. Your lungs are full of liquid. And he said, it's either of two things that's gone wrong on your body. One is the heart or the other is your thyroid. The thyroid con controls the liquids in your body. And if your heart is not producing enough blood through the body, the thyroid doesn't understand the difference between the different types of liquids. It just starts storing liquid in order to, to help. And so it did it on the feet first, it does it on the legs next, and then it goes to the lungs. And he said, your lungs are 80% full of liquid. So, so we're going to give you some medications to take care of that problem, diuretic. And he said, but now we need to find out what the cause is. He says, I doubt if it's the thyroid. He said, I'm not seeing any, there be other indications that you would be seeing if it were a thyroid problem. So he said, I think it's a heart problem. So I'm going to send you to a cardiologist. So I go to see the cardiologist and he confirms, yes, it's a heart problem. The left ventricular chamber of my heart, which is the, the chamber that pushes the blood out into the body, is running at 30% normal. He said, we need to do something about that right now. I said, okay, fine. Well, other complications happened. <laughs> why not? We, you know, you have one problem. Why not have more? Get them all at the same time. Take care of them all at the same time. I that all happened in December of 12, 2012. 13 January, I got a blister on my right foot. It was expected by me because I had gotten gotten some new moccasins, and moccasin the leather would cause some uh, blisters. And so I wasn't too worried about it. I put a bandage on it and let it sit. And a couple of weeks later, I took the bandage off and it was orange pus underneath it. That's not what I was expecting. So I made an appointment to see the doctor. February comes and he's taking a look at it. And he says, why did you tell me this immediately? He started bawling me out. Now, he was about six inches shorter than me. I'm at that time was about six foot two. And he was a very calm, quiet person, but he was in my face and he was yelling at me. You're a diabetic. You're a diabetic. You're a diabetic. And so I just go, okay, great. Just great. I said, I thought I was nearly a diabetic. So no, you're a diabetic. He said, we need to take care of this right now, immediately, today. And I said, okay. He says, you need to go to the hospital now. I said, okay. And he said, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 that won't, that won't work. He says, you need to go to ER. You need to go to ER right now. I said, okay. And he goes, wait, wait, no, 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 that won't work either. I'm going, okay, what's the problem here? And he goes, well, 
we need to get you there now. And I'm going, well, ER is about as fast as we can do, right? He goes, no, no, no. He says, I'm going to make an appointment for you at ER. An appointment in ER. Now, I said, how, how do you do that? And he says, I'm a doctor. I can do that. Okay. So he makes an appointment. You know, he says, it's going to take a couple of hours before we can get you in. He says, I'll give you a call when it's ready. So Nancy and I went out and got something to eat. And Nancy was, of course, terrified. She said, what's going on? I said, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the heart and now the foot. So the end result of that was I needed to have three surgeries in 10 days on my right foot. It was a viral infection. Viral infections can't be managed by medication. They can be stopped from growing, getting worse by giving you some shots of antibiotics. And that will, that will hold it in place and not allow it to grow anymore or grow any further. But by that point in time, he took a look at it. The doctor who took a look at it, who was going to do the surgery, he said, yeah, it's, it's, eating, it's eating your foot. And I said, eating it. He goes, yes, yes. And I said, what do you mean by eating? He says, it's actually eating the bone and it's eating the tendon on the bottom of your foot attached to the big toe. And we need to get in there immediately and do something about it or you could lose your foot. Well, for that. So I was, went to the hospital and had three surgeries in 10 days. And I couldn't walk on my right foot anymore. It just didn't work the same as it used to. That tendon being gone made a ma ma major difference in how I was able to handle it. So the hospital said, well, you have to leave now. And I'm going, how do I do that? I can't walk. And I've got antibiotics being given to me through my arm all day, all night. And he said, well, well, we'll have to work something out. Uh, maybe you can do it from home. I said, well, if I understand correctly, I have to have a nurse twice a day checking the, the uh, condition. And they said, yeah, yeah, that, that probably won't work either. So they suggested maybe going to a rehabilitation uh, location. And they had a list of about 20 to do. And so Nancy, bless her heart, took a day off from work and spent the whole day visiting rehab centers she said, it was rather quick in some cases. She said, some of them, I'd walk in the door, it smelled so bad, I turned around and walked right back out. And she said, and some of them I walk into, they didn't smell, but they had people sitting in wheelchairs in the hallways, and they were being ignored. They were trying to get, when somebody was walking by, the, you know, the caretaker, they were trying to get their attention. The, the caretaker said, no, well, I'm too busy. And they leave them. And she said, that's not a place we want you to go. So she finally found a place that seemed to be more acceptable, and I was sent there. I was there for about five days, and I was learning how to walk. <laughs> they gave me a walker initially, and of course, they want you upright, and they want you moving a lot. And it, it, same thing with the hospitals. They want you moving around a lot, staying upright. So I was doing that, and they were starting to think about crutches, and uh, that wasn't working too well. Like I said, after about five days, it had become a pretty much a routine, what, you, what I did every day. So I, one morning, had, had breakfast. I think it was scrambled eggs, bacon, fruit, juice, coffee, that kind of thing. And the nurse came in, like she always did every morning. And she went over to the computer, which is attached to the wall. And she had her back to me and she was logging into it. Since I was a diabetic, they were giving me insulin and she had to do all this stuff related to that. And Jay also to also take a blood sample to see how things are going. I finished my breakfast and I was just lying there waiting for her. And I felt a little disruption in my stomach a little bit. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird. And then the next time it was, I feel like I'm going to throw up. And thought, no, no, that doesn't make sense. I, I mean, I had pretty good breakfast. It wasn't poor food poisoning or anything like that. What's going on? Did it again, only stronger. And that time I said, I think I'm going to throw up. And so I told the nurse that. She had her back to me and she was still typing, oh, I'll, I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> okay. And finally, I just threw up. I threw up over me and the bed, the floor, the breakfast tray, which was a little bit further away. I had really good aim. It did. And then I started dry deeding. 
And by that point in time, she had pushed a button someplace, and these two large men, I think football players or something, sumo wrestlers, I don't know, they, they came in, and they picked me up like I weighed nothing and wrapped me up, put me in a chair, and then cleaned up the whole place. I mean, just, it was, it was all cleaned. And put me back. And it, I think that all happened like in five minutes. Well, a little while later, the nurse came back in again. And this time she had a, little, a teaspoon of water and a bag. And she brought it over to me and she said, I want you to drink this water. And I said, I'll throw it up. She said, that's the idea. I want you to throw it up. Okay. And you're going to spit it into this bag. Okay. Not sure I have enough spit to do that, but okay. And sure, that's what happened. So she got her sample. She took it and left. I'm pretty tired. I'm not feeling like doing anything. A couple of hours went by, and finally she came back, and she told me that the room was now under a quarantine. No one's allowed to come in except nurses, doctors, and technicians. No family, no friends were allowed to come in. And she said every two hours, somebody will be coming in to check to see how you're doing day and night. And you have to respond, even if it's required, if it's just a grunt. And I said, well, what's going on? She said, well, you will get the information soon. The doctor will be by to tell you. She said, but you have the norovirus. I heard about the norovirus. In 2012, there was an epidemic across the United States. It was national news for quite some time. It was hitting rest homes and nursing homes and such. And it was killing them. And I'm sitting there going, oh, great. Now I got something that I could die from. They said the doctor would come in to talk to me. Well, he did. It took him three or four hours, but he showed up. His specialty was norovirus and pneumonia. And he said, they're kissing cousins. He said, in fact, one or the other of them is the primary cause of death for humans. <laughs> that shit. Really? She said, yeah, yeah. What happens is the immune system is worn down so much that if they can take over, one or the other will take over and kill you. He said it basically attacks the immune system. And quite frankly, it's there all the time. It's around us all the time. But we're all natives to the, of, the, of this planet. We have an automatic immune system to and pneumonia, and norovirus. But when you get worn down, as you are, you're susceptible. And I said, so what do we do now? He says, well, we wait. I said, wait? There's no medications or anything for that? He said, well, there's some, but to, for what we're talking about here, no, it would not work. And I said, okay. And he said, is there any other questions? And I said, yeah. What are my chances? Thought about it for a minute, too, and said, well, about 40%. And I'm going, oh, and he said, and he started to leave. I said, wait, 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 wait a minute. 40% of chance of dying or 40% chance of living? And he said, oh, about 40% chance of living. I said, well, that's close to 50. I guess I can live with that. I just made a pun, but he didn't, he didn't get that. And he said, well, actually, considering the fact that, let's see, You've been diagnosed with congestive heart failure. You're a diabetic. You just had three surgeries in 10 days. And you're here because you can't walk on your right foot anymore. That could be enough going wrong in a matter of two months that you may have an attitude of, I don't care anymore. He said, in which case, things get really bad. He said, what we've learned, he said, though there's no stats for this at all, this is back in 2013, so I don't know the current stats. But at that time, he said, there is no statistics related to why the person will die or not die. There is no known reason. But one thing that doctors have discussed quite privately, and we again don't know how to diagnose it, is that it has to do with attitude, the patient's attitude. Does the patient want to live or is just giving up? And he said, well, the 
if you're feeling like you want to live and continue, your chances are higher than the percentages that I just gave you. Percentages are based on the data that they have. It has nothing to do with the patient directly. I said, I think I want to live. He said, good attitude. Keep it up. And he left. So there I am. <laughs> well, I don't have to get up and do walks anymore. <laughs> no more uh, trying to figure out how to walk on a foot. In fact, nothing. There was nothing. Occasionally, somebody would show up to check their antibiotics. Do I have enough or not? Oh, yeah. And now I don't get food anymore. I get a nutritional supplement given to me through a needle. So now I have two needles in my right arm. And that's about it. No checkups for anything to see how my diabetes is doing. Well, you know, hell, if you die, why do we care about diabetes? Yeah. And I'm on death watch. That's what they meant by the nurse coming every two hours. Every two hours. They put up a curtain between me and the door so that when they opened the door to come in, there was at least something in between me and there. You know, wouldn't be blown in by air by opening the door. So that's another part of the quarantine. So these people were coming in every two hours, day and night, and I never saw them. All I hear is, Mr. Thompson, how are you doing? And I had to give them an answer. I don't know what it would feel like for you, but for me, I felt like I'd been condemned, forgotten. They didn't even come in to bother to turn on the lights in the room at night, you know, when get stuff. And we're talking February. In the Northwest, it's cold, dark by what, 4.30, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, something in that time frame. It doesn't get light out till after 7.30 or so in the morning. Thing. No, no lights, no nothing, no contact with humans. I didn't even have a button to push a button anywhere. I had been working during that period of time. When I was in the hospital and in rehab, I had a laptop with me. And I was hooked up to a VPN interface to IBM. And I was still working. But when I got into rehab, it was less often I was working. And now I didn't feel like working at all. I called my manager, told him what was going on. That was fantastic. His, act, his response immediately, I want you to get well. He said, don't worry about work. You will still be here when you get here. When you get back, no problem. He said, all your medical, I checked, is covered. Everything. You won't have to pay a penny on it. And he says, your health is the most important thing to IBM right now. Job is secondary. It will be waiting for you when you get back. Just get well. Concentrate on being well. I gave him Nancy's phone number and I gave, via a nurse, Nancy, I gave her my manager's phone number in case either one of them needed to talk to each other. And he did call her and talk to her and gave her the same information. And she called him once or twice to say what was going on. The day after I'd been told, I noticed that I couldn't move my toes. You know, I'd have to stretch out a little bit, especially if you're lying in bed all the time. Stretch out and you know, stretch out the toes a little bit. No, they didn't move. Oh, well, that's a little odd. Maybe it's, you know, they're just falling asleep because I'm lying in bed all day. The next thing was my feet didn't move. I couldn't move my feet. Then it was my legs. Then it was my fingertips. Then my fingers. Then my hands. My arms. My back, torso, I couldn't move in the bed. Five days of that, slowly, the body is dying. I didn't want to die. What's going on here? Where's that thing? What? That doctor said, you know, you should, you should be okay if you're thinking of good thoughts. You know, the body was dying. At the end of the fifth day, the sixth morning, about one o'clock in the morning, I didn't have a clock. I mean, black, you can't see it at night anyway. But I knew the schedule of the nurses. And they changed around midnight. By the time they got around 1 o'clock, they got to me. Mr. Thompson, how are you doing? That morning, she came in the door. Mr. Thompson, how are you doing? My response was a grunt. I could not talk. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. And she left. She never came back. That was when I realized... I am dying, a slow death, but I'm dying. 
I started thinking about, well, what would friends think if I were dead? How would they react? I started with coworkers. My coworkers were in New York. I'm in Oregon. But I went out to see them twice a year and uh, worked with them for a week at a time. So they knew of me. Some of them knew me a little bit. Well, they probably do what I did when we had a person, while I was still working there, die. They took a collection. They sent a card around, and we'd sign the card. And the company would pay for flowers and send them to whoever. And then life went on. So that's probably what's going to happen with him. What about close friends? I have some close friends. I mean, I've been, ones I've known since high school and college. What are they going to do? Well, they all live pretty much on the West Coast. Yeah. There's one that lives in Boston. But, you know. The others are all on the West Coast. They would show up probably at some point in time and have some sort of remembrance in a party. Hopefully have a good time. Yeah, that's okay. What about loved ones? How are you going to handle loved ones? I thought, well, my relatives for the most part had died. But Nancy's folks were very dear to me. I thought of them as my parents. They were just fantastic people. Don, he would take it pretty hard, but he'd be okay. My birthday was on his birthday. And he had told me only about a month or two before, privately, that he thought of me as his son. He had two daughters. He always wanted to have a son. Nancy, her marriage, she married, well, what I consider a jerk. He was a third cousin, an absolute jerk. And she discovered that after 27 years and divorced him. <laughs> a little slow, but she got there. And he hated, well, he hated her husband, but he loved me. He said, she got it right on try number two. Mary, Nancy's mother, she, she, was, she was a worry wart, and she was the matriarch. She ruled. I mean, she ruled. Don brought his paycheck home, and she took it. But she would be worried mostly about Nancy, my love. Yeah, she's my love. At that point in time, she did not believe in anything after you die. You're dead. You're dead. That's it. If a cat died, she mourned the cat for months. She had a good friend die. It took a year for her to get over that. Good God, how would she deal about me? I thought about, well, no, no, she, she, she runs a school for uh, arts, art school for kids, dance, music, theater, visual arts. And she's raising her three grandchildren. She has reason to stay here. She'll stay. She'll be okay. She'll manage. Now I'm down to the list of, well, that's it. The room got dark. Well, yeah, it was dark. <laughs> I mean, it got silent, completely silent. And I thought to myself, I give up. A voice appeared on my left side of my ear saying, why are you still here? You know how to fly away. You've done it many times. Just fly away. And they repeat it over and over again. I had no response to that at all. None. I wasn't thinking. Thought had stopped. Eventually, I have no idea. Time didn't mean anything at that point. But you're in a dark room, nobody around. The golden sphere of souls appeared. I call it that because, well, that's what it is to me. I've had it show up two times before in my life. Both times down at the condo I had it's on the Oregon coast. Both times when I was feeling very low. It show up there. It's about four feet in diameter, golden colored, and it's got radi radiating golden energy out from that. It is filled with white and silver flashing lights. Hundreds, maybe thousands of them in that, in that sphere. They, each one of them represents a soul working together as one. When I was at the beach, it would come in. When I beckoned it to come into the, into the unit, it usually showed up outside the unit, in the, outside of a window. 
It came through and then stop, and I'd have to ask it to come forward again. And then it would come to me and hug me. I mean, my entire body was inside it. It just, I was in a cocoon of love, unconditional love, beautiful, warm. And it would go on for, well, not long enough, <laughs> but long enough to get me out of my mood. And here it is now, just beyond my bed, below my back feet. And it stopped there. And I said, yes, I have to ask it to come forward. So I said, please come forward. And it came forward and covered my feet and stopped. And my feet were warm. And that's when I realized my body was dead cold. And I waited. It wasn't moving. No, no, please, please come forward. And it started moving up my legs ever so slowly encasing my my legs in that energy, that golden energy, as it moved slowly, very slowly. It seemed like it's going forever to go up the body. And when it got up to the point where my hands were my head on my side, it was like a scanner. It moved out. So it hit the tips of my toe of my fingers and then my fingers and then my arm, hand and arms. And so it was also doing the torso, just slowly moving up the body. Ever, ever, ever so slowly. And when it got to my heart, I was like, oh, whoa, I was elsewhere. I was elsewhere. I was in the middle of the universe. Oh, my God. It's beautiful. I could feel everything. I can see and feel the planets, the moons around them, the galaxies, everything. The entire universe. I can feel the whole thing. It's all one. I am part of it. I can feel the energy between everything. The dark matter. It's all flowing around. I become aware of the fact that there's multi-universes. They're all connected together. And it's so beautiful. I'm watching this happen. And I'm watching it in kind of a speeded up mode. I'm watching asteroids hit planets. Destroying the planet, but so destroying, creating something new by mixing it with other debris in the universe. Destruction is a form of creation. Creation then becomes destruction. Destruction becomes creation. It is so beautiful. I could just stay here forever. I just love it. I, I, I don't even know how to explain the connection with everything. But it is so real. It is so real. I'm told I can ask questions. I only have a couple. Where was I created and when? And the next thing I know, I'm stuck in a white ball with hundreds, if not thousands, of other souls. We're all white, little, little white things. And we're all enjoying this. Because something is going to happen. Something beautiful is about to happen. We're ready for it. We're ready to go. We're ready to go out and whatever we're supposed to do next. This is bad, guys. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. And all of a sudden, bam! And the white speckles called the souls are shot out throughout the universe. All through the universe. We're going, and we're giggling, and we're laughing, we're having joy. Joy. Beyond belief, joy. We're flying through the air, through the space. So wonderful. We can do that forever. We can do this forever. This is great. This is great. And I'm starting to get tired. No, no, no. I want to stay. I want to stay. This is great. I'm home. I'm home with everybody else. This is where I want to be. I want to stay here. No, you're getting tired. You're getting tired. No, no, please, please. No, you're getting tired. You're getting tired. Then become aware that. There's something in front of me, but I can't see it. It's light. There's a lot of light. And there's something kind of dark to the right a little bit. But the light, I'm more interested in the light. Is that home? Can we go back home? I've been waiting for it. And then I hear this voice behind me yell out, Well, Greg, open your goddamn eyes and take a look. Yeah, it's a hospital room. But what was that darkness? And I turned to the right. There's a man standing there, dressed in black. And he's got a book and he's reading from it. Who is he? What's he doing there? 
He's got a white collar. He's a priest. Why the a priest? Why? I'm not religious. I'm not religious in any way, form. Spiritual, yes, but I don't belong to any church or anything like that. that they don't fit for me. Why is he there? He finally closes the book, looks down, sees me, and says, Oh, hello. I said, Hello. I can talk. If I can talk, yeah, I can move my toes, my feet, my legs. I can stretch my legs out, my fingers, arms. They all stretch out. I can stretch my back. I can stretch my neck, and I can talk. You'll never believe what happened last night. And I tell him the story of what I just told you. He starts off kind of concerned, and then slowly he gets a big smile on his face and a grin from ear to ear. He says, well, good, good. You're feeling obviously better now. I, I need to go. And he turns. I said, wait, wait. He turns around, comes back, says, what? I said, why were you there in the first place? I'm not Catholic, and I've never seen you here before. He goes, oh, I make my daily rounds to those who need me. Then it hit me. He had just given me last rites. I understand. He nodded and started to walk away. I said, wait, 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 wait. He goes, what? And he turns. I said, can you tell the nurse I'm hungry? He slapped his knee and said, I'll let her know. And he ran out of the room. In a matter of an hour or so, nurses, doctors, technicians, individually or in groups, came to see me. And they all came because they wanted to see the man who died and came back to life. I his, the curtain was still up between me and the door. So if anybody came in, my family could now come in. They had to walk past the curtain before they could see me, right? And first one's with Pat and Jack. I'll never forget this. Pat was talking away. She was just saying, oh, we're happy we can get to see you finally. We get to come in and see you. It's going to be great. You know, glad to know you're feeling better. She got past the curtain and saw me. She was at the base of the bed. And she goes, she, just, she and Jack both just stared at me. They didn't do anything. They just stopped. It's like slow motion. They just stopped. I go, hello? Oh, that woke him up. You're so gray. You're so gray. You're, you're, you're so gray. I go, okay. <laughs> and this, she said, oh, I'll just leave these flowers here and, and let you rest. And they left. I thought at least they'd ask me how I felt or anything, you know, like something. No. Everybody did that. All the, all, all the, all the visitors came, come in and said the same thing. You're so gray. You're so gray. I was getting kind of tired of it, you know. I was saying hello, waking them up, and kind of. Nancy finally got there. She had to get the grandkids off to uh, school. She finally got there, and she came around the corner. She goes, Grand! She came around and jumped up on top of me. And she said, you can't die. I'm not done with you yet. That has kept me alive. You can't die. I'm not done with you yet. There have been some tough moments since then, and all I have to do is think about that, and no, there's no problems. There are no problems at all. I couldn't talk. I couldn't breathe. She was on top of me. <laughs> Finally, I got her attention, and she's deaf, but she has one really good ear, so she came down and said, I can't breathe. She rolled over to the side, and she said, well, you look, you look pretty good, though. You're gray. And I said, everybody keeps saying I'm gray. She says, well, haven't you seen yourself? I'm going, how would I do that, lying here in bed? She goes, oh, oh, well, and it's a nurse walked by. She said, nurse, nurse, do you have a hand mirror someplace? She said, oh, yeah, I got one in my locker. I'll go get it. So she came back, brought it in, and put it in front of me. And yes, I was gray. My lips were blue, and my face was gray. The nurse said, that's going to take two or three days before they start looking okay again. I said, okay, fine. So that's the end of that one. I feel like I learned an awful lot, though. I, why did I see the universe? It's a question people would say sometimes. I think it's because I'm interested in the universe. Or universes. I think I'm going to stay in a metaverse. And I'm curious about it. So I'm interested in that. 
Some people are more interested in something of a religious nature. They want to see a religious character of some sort. That's what they see first. I suspect I don't have any authority on this. Okay, my personal view is that that's a way to ease you in to going home. You go to something that's expected. They ease you through that. They being those who care and care caretakers or whatever help you, guides. And it will eventually take you to where you're supposed to be going next. Personal opinion, that's all. Anyway, that's, that's my two NDEs. Greg, thank you so much for sharing your near-death experiences. I was just, I felt like I was there with you. You're such a good storyteller. Thank you. So if you're, if it's mutually beneficial to you, I would love to have you back sometime. I really enjoyed this. Okay. Sounds good. All right. I'm, I'm up for it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll just close this out then. Just a reminder that Greg's links will be in the description, his website and his book. So feel free to check those out. Greg, thank you so much. I so enjoyed hearing your experiences and there's so much I would like to ask you. So maybe we'll do this again sometime. Okay. Sounds good to me. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for watching the Love Covered Life podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, share this video with your friends, and comment with your thoughts and opinions. And check the description box for the links to my TikTok and Instagram where I share the more personal side of my life, my website where I share my paintings and merch, and also the Be A Guest link for anybody who's interested in sharing their story. Be loved, be happy, be at peace, and thank you for watching.